regulated. One, two, one, two, three, four. This podcast focuses on regulatory and corporate developments in highly regulated spaces. I'm Christian Bax, and I used to regulate medical marijuana. I'm Tony Glover, and I used to regulate alcoholic beverages, casino gaming, and tobacco. Now together, we're regulated. Welcome back to another episode of Regulated. How you doing, Tony? Happy New Year. Good to be back. Happy New Year to you. Another year, another fantastic set of very interesting regulatory stories that are going to be blossoming throughout the U.S. And, and North America and the world. And we're here to talk to you each week about our favorite our favorite kind of breaking regulatory issue. And we, we have two very interesting ones for you today. So, Tony, let's go ahead and, and kick off a little magic mushroom action. Yeah, there's an interesting story from January 7th in Bloomberg Business Week from Adam Peori. And it's a shroom therapy startup is edging towards FDA approval. Now, we told you last year that psychedelics and mushrooms are starting to heat up. And it's something in 2020 that we're certainly going to be doing some more content. So stay tuned for some interviews with people who are entrepreneurs and advocates in that space. But but let's let's look at this article. So Compass is running a 216 patient phase 2B clinical trial, which is typically the second to last stage before a drug gets the FDA nod. And it's made enough synthetic doses of the psychoactive, psychoactive ingredient in magic mushrooms to supply more than 30,000 patients. Uh, some context on the money behind this, they've already raised $58 million in venture capital. And that includes money from Peter Thiel, who I think we've, we've spoken about. He's part of the PayPal mafia and is a, a substantial venture capitalist formerly of Silicon Valley. I think he's moved to LA and of course has some some ties to politics, you know, close observers will know as well. But also interesting is who's on their board of advisors. They've got a former director of the US National Institute of Mental Health and a former head of the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, on its board of advisors. So, I mean, this is kind of a gold-plated uh, mushroom startup, it looks like, and it seems like they're making some progress on the regulatory front. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting area of regulatory law in, in the fact that you're looking at these guys who have money, who have influence, and having that FDA connection. It, I mean, Tony, it, it's just so, it's so interesting. It's so fascinating that there's actually already with this thing, it, it seems to be a fairly straightforward approach and a, a kind of firm direction of where they, they go from here. So depression is the focus on this trial. And it's interesting because the current psychotherapy and selective serotonin reuptake inhibit inhibitors only work for about 70% of patients. So there's a, you know, when you look at the total addressable market, it, you're talking about a lot of people. This is a big opportunity. And this follows a trend. And this is all in the article we'll share on Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. There's a trend of big pharma trying to establish medical uses for other drugs. So this follows a trend of big pharma trying to establish other medical uses for recreational drugs. And this is all in the article. But they note that uh, the FDA approved Johnson & Johnson Spray Vato, which is a nasal spray <laughs> derived from the club drug ketamine that was approved back in March. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, I, you know, I don't know how we missed the boat on doing a Spray Vato episode. I don't know how we missed that. <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> that's a great uh, I want to know how much they paid their PR people to come up with that name. That is an awesome name. <laughs> but OK, moving on, 11 U.S. labs are running clinical trials on MDMA, which, you know, uh, people on the street called Molly or ecstasy. Uh -huh. And that's to help treat post-traumatic stress disorder. And then, of course, you just have generally patients are using medical marijuana in a number of states to treat a number of ailments from. Um, stress to depression to insomnia to arthritis. So, you know, you continue to see these things that were very illegal <laughs> several years ago are now being legitimized. And I think this is just uh, another another step in the path. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the website, actually, Tony. It's Privato TM, one word. It's, uh, it's crazy that here in 2020, it's possible that you can help address or help medicate your depression with a... Uh, a nose spray. Uh, are you familiar with Gallagher, the comedian? Yes. 
So the the spray vado sounds like it would be next to the sledgeomatic. <laughs> 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 like, what is he doing with the spray vado on stage? You know, I, it's it's just a ridiculous name, but it, it's an interesting product, and it's funny how far we've come on ketamine. I mean, <laughs> I mean, ketamine is a pretty far out there drug in terms of uh, in terms of street usage, and now it's. Uh, something that might be at a Publix or you know a Publix pharmacy or a CVS sometime soon. It's interesting to see. There's see there's movement on ketamine. There's movement on psychedelics. Where we are with uh, cannabis, and I'm wondering where we find that line because it seems like there's there's been I don't want to call it a renaissance, but but certainly this this pendulum has swung so dramatically where there's some very serious institutional look at what previously were considered to be very dangerous verboten drugs as the, as the whether or not they may have practical uses under a, you know, an FDA uh, framework. Yeah. So I want to read another quote It's from Rick Doblin. He's executive director of the advocacy group, multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies. And uh, of course he may be a future guest. I can't wait to reach out to him. I'll probably DM with DM, DM him within five minutes of this podcast ending, but he said that the rise in the for-profit psychedelic pharma efforts are a sign of our success over the past 33 years in changing the political dynamics at the FDA, changing the public attitudes towards this, and making it possible. And I agree. Between him, his association, and other advocates, and then also, as he noted, sort of the rise of medical marijuana. You know, if medical marijuana can make it as far as it has, you know, anything can. So it's just a matter of time. So you, when you look at this article, it's it's quoting some people who are some of those first movers right now. And to me, there's there's two very interesting developments that are going to come from this, right? So the first is the very corporate, very litigious, very savvy as far as IP, but the the big pharma, right, who are certainly watching this wave start. It's, it's not cresting, but this, this wave is starting to form and they're certainly going to be looking at this, trying to figure out how to capture that market. So it'll be interesting to watch the moves that big pharma is going to make with this. And then the other side is what the, you know, the airport Ramada in type of entrepreneur is going to do with this, because um, that's kind of what we saw with cannabis, where there's a, there's a fair amount of, of upstanding, um, strong players in the market. And then, you know, there's a lot of chicanery that's happening at the fringes. And I expect the same thing to be true here, where people are going to see some of these cities move to decriminalize, and they're going to see some positivity expressed in place like Bloomberg, where we're reading this article from. And they're going to start looking for, okay, how do, how do we, how can we kind of make some money on the, on the fringes of this? Right. And, and th- you got to be careful about that if you want to see psychedelics continue to kind of have forward progress, because it, all it takes is one or two cautionary tales and you kind of claw back a lot of the progress that you make. Well, the industry, from the perspective of an entrepreneur, it's between a rock and a hard place. And both of those, the rock and the hard place is the FDA, because either you go through the clinical trials and become approved as a, as a pharmaceutical, or you try to exist in one of these localities that have allowed mushrooms and these other substances to, to be offered or at least be possessed. But then you can't make any claims, right? You can't make any claims about the effectiveness to treat certain conditions. So it, so it, it really it, you know, puts the market on two tiers. And one of the tiers is extremely challenging to enter, being the FDA approval process. You know, People raise millions of dollars just to go through the trial in the regulatory step. And then, and then the other tier is you're, you're very hamstrung in terms of your marketing efforts. Mm-hmm. And, and what's the point of selling mushrooms if you can't tell people that it fixes depression? <laughs> you yeah. know, I you mean, can, you can't brag about it, and, you know? And to be clear from an FDA perspective, like what we're talking about is we're assuming when Tony and I talk about these types of issues, we're, we're assuming that up till now, the progress has been made because it's safe, right? But that's that's kind of the purpose of the FDA process is consumer safety and making sure that when you expose a, a very large group of people, even even a relatively small number of significant side effects or, or negative health impacts can can kill a drug. So when we talk about issues like this, it, it's good that the FDA is in, involved, but it's not a foregone conclusion that if it goes to the FDA process, that according to that systematic review, that it's going to, in the end, turn out to be a safe 
product to be that the FDA would necessarily approve, right? Right, right. Well, so this is something we're definitely going to circle back on and expect some interviews either from the entrepreneurial community or from the association community in 2020. But speaking of things we're looking at doing in 2020, Christian and I have discussed, and this isn't quite ready for announcement, but for an announcement, but you know, we discussed doing some more sin beat topics, some things that are a little bit edgier and things that are becoming more accepted in terms of regulated in certain jurisdictions, things of that nature, at mm-hmm. least the discussions are happening. And mm-hmm. I think your story this week uh, really fits in that category. What do you have for me? For the listeners at home, covering a story should not be confused as an endorsement for the industry, right? So I want to say that up front because I had, I've talked to some very close friends over Christmas about the issue that we're going to get into because for me, the interesting, the most interesting part of this pod and really the most interesting part of being a regulatory lawyer is new, outside the box, crazy issues that you, you can't believe you're actually, you're actually dealing with. Um, wait, wait, and, and actually that, that, that reminds me, maybe we should put a trigger warning on this. Yeah, yeah. So trigger <laughs> warning. I mean, if, if you've got that, we're not going to go into anything too overt, but we, maybe we're not. not we're not going to be graphic, but if, if yeah. you um, don't want to hear about. Um, uh, it's a little robot, sexual. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a little sexual. It's a little robotic and, and we'll treat it with as adults. Right. But it is also absurd. So right. So <laughs> you, know, you can make the decision now whether you want to stick around for it or not. Right. So basically, if you're, you know, small children or if you generally Westworld, the show Westworld was a little bit too much for you, eh, maybe go ahead and come back to us next week. But I'll just read you the title of the story. Uh, it, it's from Venture Vancouver. And the title of the story is Father Son Team Bringing Sex Doll Rental Service to Vancouver. Now, again, this is not an endorsement, but it is something that when you when you Google this issue, it's it's popping up with kind of the steady drumbeat of something that again, it's operating on the fringes, but it's it's growing. And this is coming out of our favorite source for kind of deviant behavior, which is Japan. And it's this this phenomenon of these these lifelike humanoid things that people buy for intimacy purposes is is actually pretty popular there. And it's starting to move into Western markets. So specifically, this story is focusing on Canada. But if you go to some of these U.S. tech fairs, these tech seminars, these things are showing up more and more because, you know, everybody knows, right? The, the inflatable plastic novelty doll, like everybody's seen these things that barely look, they look like gifts. Yeah. Right. They look like, uh, you know, Nintendo 64 characters from like 1996. Whereas if you look at what today it's, it's not that anymore. These things are like Silicon. They, they look and feel like people actually some of these, some of these stores, some of these companies have like Instagram accounts and they, they're not white people, but they, they look like if you go to Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, they look like that. So 96% of the way there, you can tell they're not people, but like if you look down them out of the corner of your eye, you would be confused or you would be convinced. And so the story is there's these two guys, right? So there's a father and a son. And I, it, I think that the, so the father, they're, they're both oil and gas workers and, and the father basically stepped off out of the ga- oil and gas field, got a payout. And, uh, they they used capital to start this service and they both acknowledged so two really funny things at the outset is first the reporter agreed with these two guys not to list their last name for what they said was privacy <laughs> reasons so they, they didn't disclose it they they just go by one of them his name is Randy uh i think oh, Randy's I bet, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so so these two guys have uh have started now they were it worked in Calgary, and then they started in another in another city, and now they're moving into Metro Vancouver. What's interesting is the the last couple of years when you see these stories, the stories have been these guys are guys like this are opening brothels, right? So they're like a building that they open to that people come to in the same way that you would go to a brothel, but instead of having sex with a person. You you get a doll. You get to pick one of these dolls. It's basically. It sounds like it's a it's a gold's gem for robotic adult toys. 
Right. You know what they say the best workout is. And so absolutely. And so these guys go in, and they, they, they pay by the hour. And I they, personally, am I, I, I'm more of a bench press guy. I jog, <laughs> <laughs> I shoot hoops. <laughs> okay. So get this, right? These guys are very entrepreneurial. They're, they're taking a new tack with that. So these guys have started a rental company. And so what you can do is you can either rent it by the, you can rent it by the hour, you can rent it overnight, you can rent it for a full day. And so these guys, it's like a Rick and Morty episode. These guys will, they'll either, you can come pick your doll up or they'll, they'll ship, they'll deliver it to you in a, in like a this sterile looking black box and you. Oh, so this, so none of the activity is happening on site. Right. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Okay, I got you. But All right. They're, they're so still- this, is, this is more like an escort service where you're, you're, you're going on a date with the equipment. Right. Well, so there's, what's interesting here is because what I think about this, the regulatory issue that's interesting for me is, so let's, let's first take the brothel, right? Is ultimately these things happen in a place and that place is regulated by, is regulated. So it's regulated by state ordinance and it's regulated by, I mean, by local ordinance and it's regulated by state law. And so the reason why I say I stop at state is because usually for example, prostitution, you're, it, it, it's, if you're prosecuted for prostitution, you're prosecuted under state laws typically. And so this, this interesting legal area where, where first, this is not expressly a, a crime. And so it falls to the local government for ordinances. And a, a lot of these local governments that have these things pop up have to they're having to turn on their heels and try to find some way. Usually the, the reaction is they try to ban them. It's really interesting because they're not doing anything illegal, but it it mirrors the, the conduct, at least half of the conduct of prostitution. This rental thing is interesting because the same activity is happening, but there there's and there's still a locus of where the business is operating, where these dolls are stored, but the actual act is happening at somebody's home, their domicile their, or their hotel room, something like that, hopefully. So it, it presents a really interesting issue for local governments who are going to have to <laughs> decide basically whether or not these things can exist well, within their borders. I, I feel a lot better about this purely from a regulatory standpoint. You know, I had some heartburn. I thought there was activity occurring on premises. Now, you know, n- now that I understand that this is a to go a to go business so to speak, I, I guess you could call it carry out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, now that now that I understand exactly. that, that any, you know any activities are occurring all, you know outside of the 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 premises, you know, I don't really have much heartburn about this because it's really the same business function as selling a product. Um, it's just a short, you know, it's just a short-term lease. So, you know, I don't think there is much regulatory exposure. Uh, certainly some local ordinances would be would would present some problems. But, you know, this is very timely because as we're recording this, TechCrunch just published an article about CES, which is the Consumer Electronics Show um, that happens in Vegas every mm-hmm. year. It's it's where, you know, generally I think this year Sony introduced an electronic car. You know, you see a lot of things, televisions, foldable cell phones, all of the newest technology, the things that you'll see, you know, I'm sure the Razer phone was debuted there two years before it came out in the market, right? Mm-hmm. You know, things of that nature, cutting edge. And there had been a uh, a bit of a controversy over the past couple of years about whether they were going to allow sex tech products to, to participate. That segment has gotten so big and people pr- see so much opportunity that there was some discussion and CES you know, initiate a one-year trial process to allow certain manufacturers in. But anyways, you know, it's, it's funny that you bring this up because literally as we report this, or as we record this about seven minutes ago, TechCrunch um, just published an article about one of the most prominent voices in the sex tech industry making her triumphant return to CES. So that's something we'll share on the Twitter feed as well. What's super interesting about this issue and the this this industry is that it combines a couple things, right? So it's not just the doll, like the humanoid doll, but there's other parallel technologies that are are being incorporated into these dolls that's it's that's actually really interesting. So the, you know, as animatronics and robotics and AI are developing, 
they're incorporating these things into these dolls. So this is not something that I've seen much in the West. It's I've seen it mostly like stories out of Japan, but they're, they're basically taking these dolls and they, they work just like the other dolls, but they're like face moves. They can talk to you. They can, they have AI or, you know, rudimentary AI built into it so that they can, I like guess not AI, the program, they're, they're programmed so that they can hear what you basic things that you can say to them. They can process that and they can actually respond to you. So that's where we are in 2020. They, there literally are these dolls that look like they're 96% human that can talk to you and can hear and understand limited things that you say. And so think about how fast that those other subsets of technology are moving. So how fast the AI is moving, how fast robotics. Tony, I don't know if you've seen some of these Boston Dynamic videos. One of the, probably the most famous one is the one that looks like a, a quadrupedal dog, like a dog yes. on with the knees that bend backwards. If you guys haven't seen this, Google Boston Dynamic Dog and take a look at some of those videos of, and the evolution of those things where it started 10 years ago and these things were the, the, the legs and the joints barely moved. It was very rigid. And they've gotten to the point now where these things look like they're from a horror movie. Like they can run upstairs. They, they can run very fast. You, you can't kick them and knock them over. It, it basically, they look, they look like dog versions of T-1000 from, um, right. from Terminator. I am a little creeped out and worried about some of this. And part of that's because you mentioned Terminator, Skynet and all that. I mean, these these Boston Dynamics robots, uh, they look cute, but I'd also hate to be surrounded by 20 of them on the street corner <laughs> with them <laughs> demanding my papers or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. And I, I didn't want to say that because I, did, I didn't want to freak you out. But they, they, so they have a dog version, but then they have like a human version. And there's actually funny, there's like... Um, people who do satires where they they basically take video that looks just like the the humanoid version the Boston Dynamics made and it's like they're like kicking it and they're picking on it and then it turns around and like beats the crap out of them and we're probably a year or two away from that actually happening from I mean we're the, you could put weapons on these things and use them so we're we're totally there at the point where you could have these machines that that totally can have those type of applications but as we know you the the what we call sex tech so the innovations of that adult industry it evolves just as quickly as technology does i mean we could see that with the internet and how you know these pornography sites are some of the most visited sites on the internet this is the same thing is happening with robotics whereas as this progresses people people are going to use that in the adult industry well the thing that's interesting for me with this you know you mentioned artificial intelligence and and there's certainly going to be some applications for that going forward and you know we're probably within 50 years of having a real ethics conversation about how we employ artificial intelligence oh, we're here people and, are and, people are getting married to these things people are literally it, getting married to these right, sex dolls right but th but then also i mean even in the non romantic context also, how we treat artificial intelligence. I mean, the the big way you see AI on on social media is people say, "Hey, look, we we made um, this artificial intelligence read all of Alfred, you know, Adolf Hitler's books, and this is what he said." Or we made him read all the comments on YouTube, and and this is how the AI acts now. You know, even even in twenty nineteen and twenty twenty. A key training tool for artificial intelligence is to subject them to a bunch of information, a, a, a large subset of which is bad. And so, if that's enough to to start to trigger ethical conversations, when you put AI in a, in a doll that's designed and sold for sexual purposes, I mean, I think we're pretty close. You know, I, you know, we're within the fifty year window of having a broader conversation about. Hey, what is it? Is it okay <laughs> to do this to artificial intelligence? Where are we with that? Right, and we're not there yet, but that's that's coming. And HBO has literally made two seasons of a show about this called Westworld, where they they ex explore exactly that. You have these sentient these sentient machines that you can that humans can adult do adult things to that you can murder that you can just do these terrible things and they basically anytime you kill one they just wipe its memory and put it right back out there for people to interact with again but like that's the the, the very interesting subjects that you're talking about is like art right now is exploring those exact issues and and not to pivot too much but moving out of the the high tech implications i know everyone is consider is is questioning what the low tech applications 
um, and, and complications of this. So I'm going to go ahead and, and just read you straight from the story to answer one question I know just about everybody's asking. Quote, staff wash the dolls in between uses with antibacterial soap and high pressure hot water and then do a second clean with hydrogen peroxide and rubbing al alcohol. After that, they check the dolls with a black right and UVC light to ensure they're free from residue. Quote, Natural's website boasts that dolls are cleaner than any person, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll, I'll I'll just say this from a regulatory standpoint. I'm not generally the type of guy, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, that advocates for more government regulation. Yeah. But <laughs> this is this That's is a definitely case definitely going to have to be a part of this of regulating these things. <laughs> that that you, particular you, you, aspect. Do you, you know how in some states like North Carolina, um, if you walk into a restaurant, they have a grade. You know, it says 95 percent. You know, 100 percent on their last. Uh, inspection. I, I'm sure that customers of that type of establishment would like to see a grade on the door when they walk in. Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen that episode of The Office where uh, they they go to a, a trade show? Let's so like Michael and Dwight are there for uh, Dunder Mifflin Scranton, and then Jim and his new boss from wherever he was working when he wasn't at, at in Scranton. They they all go, and so like the last scene of the show, like the credit, the after credit scene, Michael and Dwight are in their room. And Michael turns off the light and Dwight's like shining a black light over his, uh, over his bed. And Dwight's like, well, it's either, uh, blood or and he's like, oh man, I hope it's blood. <laughs> <laughs> so what would one thing TBD, how much of that we're going to censor out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll censor that whole, I'll censor that whole thing out. So Tony, just, just, I, I just, wanna... just beep it out though. Okay. I want to beep it out. Don't, don't remove it. <laughs> okay. I want to I want to ask you one one other thing just from a business perspective the pricing on this seemed kind of weird so the, the the pricing that they're advertising is you can have the doll for 1 hour for $149 3 hours for $180 or all night for $249 that tells me that there's not a whole lot of like turnover for that so it seems as a business it really doesn't matter too much to them whether you have it for an hour or all night cuz the the marginal difference is only 100 bucks Right. I agree. And, you know, I, and I do have one thought about this from a, uh, you know, an additional thought about this from a regulatory perspective, because even though society is con has continued to be more modern and progressive, you know, if you're talking about sex dolls and the way that they've been legislated, you know, states have tended towards more regulation in the past few years, as opposed to less, you know, anytime you've seen um, the term sex doll in a, in, in a state legislature in the same sentence has been putting more, and by the way, very justified, more protections on on what types of dolls can be sold. So, you know, I, I wonder if you start to see if, if this technology continues to evolve, um, if you start to see state legislators, particularly in conservative um, areas of the country, start to get interested in this and start to try to put up barriers. And and specifically, I'm looking at Alabama. I could see the state legislature in Alabama, which has a history on subjects such as this, such as, as this, sort of in the sexual area. Um, I could see them taking an interest in this in the next 10 or 15 years and trying to uh, throw up a roadblock. So it'll be interesting to see. It could be kind of the reverse medical marijuana, where you see unfriendly legislatures, at least in the Bible Belt, taking action. So there's two legal issues from a state law. So when, when I say state law, I mean specifically when we're talking about criminal issues that go into play with this particular industry. The first seems to be how a jurisdiction regulates prostitution. So what the what the article that we were referencing said about what the jur the jurisdiction how that jurisdiction treats sex issues is that it's legal to sell sex but it's just not legal to buy it and these guys who are creating these sex doll businesses are are basically using that gray area of the law to to not run afoul of that jurisdiction's criminal laws so if you have a state like Alabama that would certainly have both sides of that coin, right? So it's illegal to both buy it and sell it. So both the, both the sex workers and the Johns are violating the law. It's going to be a little bit harder to have that type of business. Whereas if you have a little bit more liberal, more progressive approach to that law, where you allow for one side of that to be allowed, you create a, a broader gray area and, and you probably 
create enough leeway for some of these businesses to function. The second criminal issue uh, is a little bit of a touchy one. I don't want to go on too de too detailed on it because it, it's really disturbing, but it is what it is, is that people are making these dolls, but are making them children. Basically. Yeah. And I, so I mentioned the legislative changes. I mean, state legislators I mean, in Florida has done some work on this, but these states need to really put something on the books to protect against that if they don't already have it. So, and that's why I think that the, that's going to be the hurdle is if you allow them, but you understand that everyone agrees that these things should absolutely not be made to resemble people who are under the age of consent. It's like, how do you write that into an ordinance? Or how do you write that into a law or a, a regulation about the aesthetics of something looking like an adult and not looking like a child? It's, it, it, it seems obvious, but if you were to sit down and actually try to put pen to paper, on how you would create those kind of basically SOPs for how you build one of these things, it's going to be really hard. And so what I think because of that, you're going to have some legal, some some legislatures that are going to, we don't want to touch this with the 10 foot pole and just make it. Right, illegal. right. Okay. So that was our, uh, our robotic sex doll rabbit hole for the week. The, the, it's not Probably not going to be an issue that we touch on particularly regularly, but it, it was something that was percolating up. It was super interesting. I, I've been reading. I've been reading a lot about it because I have some clients that are that are cities that are cities and counties, and none of them have experienced this industry yet. But I've I've I may have sent a couple text messages just saying like, Have you guys ever thought about what you would do if someone opened up a sex doll brothel or rental? entity within your jurisdiction and to a man and to a woman, 0% of them had e ever even thought about what they would do. So if you're at local government or you're a lawyer that represents local governments, definitely something to start thinking about because the future will be here before you know it. Transitioning to our favorite part of the show each week. Tony, do you have any shout outs for the week? No shout out this week, but I do have kind of a point of recognition. And the point being, this is probably going to be the regulatory heartburn of 2020. <laughs> this is a going to win the award for the year and we're only one week into the year. It, it's outside of our scope, but it's so alarming and so hilarious. And, you know, even though there's been some sad things to come from it. And I'm talking about Boeing. Have you? Have you seen the internal emails that leaked from them? I have. That is uh, that is more than regulatory heartburn. That is like a regulatory stroke. Right. Uh, I think Jeff Cameron, a local sports radio guy in Tallahassee, would say that's not what you want. <laughs> 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 so let, let me let me just read these read these things. And look, and I grew up around government and politics, and you know, candidly, we were kind of taught not to put stupid things in writing. So I'm always I'm always amazed when I you know I'm kind of circumspect even with what I'll text to people in private messages. So I'm surprised to see some of this stuff on official company uh, email and text messages. So here's one from February 2018. Would you put your family on a Mac similar trained aircraft? I wouldn't. Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, well, that's good. <laughs> in another message from May of the same year, someone wrote, "Quote." I still haven't been forgiven by God for the covering up I did last year. And, and kind of, you know, I think the first rule of uh, of landing a cover up is not to text about the cover up. But, <laughs> but let me let me just say this. Let me say this. If you work in a nuclear power plant or you work at a common carrier manufacturer like Boeing, please put everything in text message because I want to see that. It, right. Like, right. I am. I am I am very glad that that got out. That that we know what what Boeing has been up to. Somebody tweeted, and I thought it was a, a really smart point about corporate culture and corporate greed. But they said, you know, beyond the question of why someone, why a company would design a plane that relied on such precarious technology just to stay in the air, what what mm -hmm. what does that tell you about the company that would do it? So even moving past the why, right. imagine the people who opt into this. What does it tell you about them? And I think that was a smart point. It tells you something about the corporate culture at Boeing, that they are willing to to push past. I mean, it's pretty clear that they had concerns about this. If 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 you start reading the details of the technical failure on these planes and also the subsequent changes they've had to make in this interim period, yeah. it's terrifying. Right. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's the most basic. It, it's, it's as problematic as if they just forgot to put 
a cockpit in the in the plane. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's the fundamental aspects of, of of keeping the plane from stalling out and crashing to the ground. So as you, as I'm sure you guys know, if you have even the most cursory knowledge about the airline industry, which I that, that's about as much knowledge as I have about it, you'll know that there's not that many large scale manufacturers of commercial air of commercial planes. You look at what Airbus, so the chief the chief competitor to Boeing, what their stock has done since October of 2019. They were at 114.36 on October 2nd. Today they're trading up at 134.42. It's, it's looking like it's a very good time to be buying into Airbus uh, right now, as Boeing is figuratively crashing into the mountain with these text messages. Well, and not to be too lighthearted about this aspect, but you know it's bad for your company identity. When uh, one of your planes is shot down over an, uh, what's essentially an active war zone, and the first thought everybody had in the world was it was a Boeing problem. <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> it, there was a long time where, you know, at least half a day where we were wondering whether that was just a Boeing 737 issue. And it turned out it wasn't a 737 Max, it was a regular Boeing 737. But still, just seeing those words and numbers combined are enough to trigger that type of response. So not a shout out to them. Go ahead and put them on the regulatory heartburn watch list for 2020. So besides, obviously, Airbus and people who own Airbus stock, I don't I don't have a shout out for the week. So we're going to go straight into our, uh, our farewells. We'll see you back very soon here. Uh, Tony and I are very much looking forward to the rest of 2020, bringing you some fresh content. We're going to get back on our regular schedule of these types of new shows, but we also got some great interviews coming up, some special subject deep dives. Uh, we've, of course, are going to have a lot to talk about during the session, which is kicking up in Florida right now. And, and there's a lot of action happening with constitutional referendums, specifically in the cannabis space over the next month. So look, look for those pods to pop up. Uh, as always, if you'd like to follow us more on a, on a day-to-day or a week-to-week basis, you can check us out at Regulated Pod. Uh, you can also check me out on Twitter at Christian Bax and Tony at Glover Law FL on Twitter. We're also on Instagram, same handle, Regulated Pod. Uh, and we very much look forward to talking to you next week. And with that, uh, thanks for listening. And I'll see you later, Tony. Well, I, I have one more thing, Christian, I want to talk oh, yes. about. <laughs> And we have our own I, after credit segment, please. Right, right. And I know this is a time where I deliver my catchphrase, right? Yeah, and that's, yeah. You kind of throw it up to me, my catchphrase. And, and maybe you think I don't listen to the podcast, but I listened to the last podcast. And, and you know, you had handled the editing on it and you tagged in a, uh, a piece at the end. And I heard you use my catchphrase and I did not give you authorization. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I just want to, I, I, I need you to stay compliant and I need everybody else to stay compliant too. Stay compliant folks.